Good afternoon. This is Orthodox Christian Theology. Um, I am Craig Trulia, and I'm doing an unplanned show uh, just on what the scriptures teach about Mary. Uh, I want to say this from the onset. To read the scriptures correctly is not necessarily going to be at all times the most obvious interpretation that you will randomly come up with when you read the Bible. Uh, proof of this would be in Galatians chapter 4, where Paul says that Sarah and Hagar are an allegory. Um, Sarah representing, you know, those saved by grace and of the New Jerusalem, and Hagar representing those under the Mosaic law of, uh, I forget which mountain he calls it, but Mount Sinai, let's say, and Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem. And if you just read that part of Genesis in isolation, you would never come to that conclusion. We see the same thing when St. Peter and uh, the other apostles preach and Acts of the Apostles, and they're quoting the Psalms. And you would never come to the conclusions that they draw from in isolation from these Psalms. The Jews immediately recognize, and Paul expects people to recognize in Galatians, those who are actually against them, because the Judaizers, that there is something here. And why is that? Because... Even among the Jews, there's an understanding that these passages were allegorical, um, that they're messianic. And this is not just me making it up. The midrashes and stuff, which we have from Judaism in that era in the B.C. and early A.D. centuries, bears that out. So that being said, um, the correct interpretation of Scripture is not always the simplest, that doesn't mean it's also utterly esoteric and makes no sense. And, you know, and there's no point in reading your Bible either. Um, reading the scriptures because God speaks by the Holy Spirit and the scriptures word for word blesses you because you're hearing God speak. But in isolation, you might not catch everything, um, the infinite depths of the scriptures, and that's okay. But the point of this video is not to utterly convince you there's no other way these passages be interpreted or something that effect. Though in some of these, you're going to find it pretty hard not to interpret them the orthodox way. Um, so I'm going to go over scriptures, and we'll start with Ezekiel chapter 44, and we'll talk about why this is relevant to what orthodoxy teaches about the Theotokos, about the mother of God. So I'm going to make the share screen a little bigger, and it's about the new temple. Ezekiel is giving uh, this prophecy. Um from the Lord about the new temple in Jerusalem. And it says, And the Lord said to me, Ezekiel 44, verse 2, This gate shall be shut and shall not be open, and no man shall enter by it, because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. As for the prince, because he is the prince, he may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He may enter by the way of the vestibule of the gateway and go out the same way. So first, let me tell you what I guess the worldly way of reading this would be, and then I'll tell you the, why we read this uh, passage during, let's say, the Feast of Dormition, why orthodoxy this as an allegory pertaining to Mary. First, let's just read what it says. In short, there's a gate. You can't open this gate. It's locked closed or whatever. It says, can't be open. No man shall enter by it. Then it names a prince who's a man. And he may enter by, by the vestibule of the gateway, meaning like uh, the corridor that leads to the gateway. So you could, he could go in and out through the vestibule, the corridor, but the gate doesn't open or close, if we're to take it literally. So obviously this is sort of confusing if you take this totally literal. And by the way, audience, audio issues, um, let me know, um, you know, how this sounds. So that being said, when taken literally, <laughs> this is kind of hard to, it doesn't make sense. He, how could he enter something he doesn't open through the corridor that's after the thing that doesn't open or close? Doesn't make sense. Um, the liberal or Protestant way of interpreting this would be, well, the prince is the exception. No man may enter but the prince and it's a gate. <laughs> like a I forget which movie, 40 First Dates with Adam Sandler. He makes the little uh, French toast cabin with the door, the toothpick, and, he goes, and it opens like that. So maybe they think that's really how you should interpret it. 
again, not what it literally says. So you're, you could already see there's an interpretive stretch there. It's not rocket science, but it's an interpretive stretch. Now, the orthodox way of reading this is you have a gate that doesn't open, and you have a prince that enters to and from the vestibule. And so the orthodox teaching is being that it literally says, because the Lord God Israel has entered by it. Right? The gate, no man shall enter because the Lord God Israel has entered by it. That's the reason. So, right, Mary is a virgin. No man shall enter into her because the Lord God has entered by it, by the gate, which is the gate of her virginity. You could use your imagination what part of the woman's anatomy that's in reference to. Right? Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. Her virginity was not violated. So... Because Lord God Israel's entered by it. So the allegory actually makes sense when we take just take it at the scripture at its word. And then it says, the prince, he the prince, he may sit and eat the bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way, the vestibule, the gateway, and go out the same way. Right? The gate doesn't open because orthodoxy teaches Mary was a virgin after birth. God does not violate or make more impure the person he's in contact with. Um, so if you have had experience of God's grace, whether in the church, whether before you went to the church, um, whether there's something in your life. You know, God granted you the grace of repentance or the grace of faith. You were more pure afterwards than before. So we believe Mary was more pure after conceiving God, right, than she was afterwards. So Christ, when he was given birth to, did not violate her. She did not lose her virginity when she gave birth because then giving birth to the Lord actually – um, made the day it took us less pure, which makes no sense. Um, we see the Christological parallel here because when Christ resurrected in the Gospel of Luke, he entered to the upper chamber and it said, though the door wasn't open, <laughs> right? So Christ had come in through uh, to and from the door without it opening. That's exactly what we see here. So that is not a coincidence. The Orthodox interpretation is actually... The only one I could give that actually is true with what we read here and which is consistent with what we read in the New Testament. Um, but again, it's an allegory, right? Uh, it's Because taking this explicitly it would be hard to understand other than allegorically. And this is actually something St. Maximus talks about. He says when there's something that historically or literally you just can't take it that way because it doesn't work, God is pointing you in the scriptures to understand this is an allegory. You have to go into the deeper meaning. So – that's the deeper meaning of Ezekiel 44. So let's go to another super important passage, which is Exodus 3, which you're going to – this is a super low-budget show. Um, I'm just going to uh, do it as we go and have fun with it, right? Exodus 3, verse 2 and 3 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the fire was not consumed. The bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great light. Why the bush does not burn? Okay, what's, what's the point of that? The point of that is that Mary is the bush that was not consumed by the fire. God is a consuming fire, like it says in the epistle to the Hebrews. So how was Mary, who had not part of God or something, the full dose of God, the hypostasis of the Logos, became was incarnate, human flesh, from her in her body, and she was not consumed. She was the burning bush not consumed by the fire. So that's the orthodox teaching from this passage. You may see this in iconography, a bush and fire, and like Mary's the bush, and you see Jesus you know, where her womb should be or something to that effect. That's what's in reference to. Um, again, there's a sense where you're the burning bush when you commune because Orthodox believe that the bread and the wine is Christ's flesh and blood. How do you not get burned? You're in contact with the energies and essence of God. Right now, I, I'm not a super philosophical expert, so I'm not sure how we don't get instantly destroyed when we touch God's essence. But Christ's physical flesh and blood, right, it's not just God's energy. The fullness of the Logos is incarnate in Jesus Christ. So the flesh and blood of Christ has his essence. 
and you're not consumed. So that's a miracle just as fantastic as the burning bush, if not more so because we're so sinful. Well, the bush is just simply fallen. It's not actually committed any sin, which, right, if you go that deep into the allegory is pretty interesting because th that's the same orthodox doctrine about Mary. So we're just going to keep going, and I'm going to just steal from my own article on this topic, orthodoxchristiantheology.com, top five Bible passages related to orthodox Mariology. Um, so I want to get to what I was a little bit referring to before about the bush being made of fallen matter. So we're going to go to Romans 8. I think it's 8.20 to verse 21, if I remember right. Uh, I'm a, Memory is not my strong suit. Being a loud mouth is. Maybe God could do something good with the loud mouthiness. We can hope so anyway. So it says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him is subjected in hope. Because the creation itself also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So as we can see, corruption, this table, this fireplace mantle behind me, even the icons, the holy icons, they're made of a creation that's bonded to corruption. It doesn't want to be. Eventually, all this will deteriorate. This wood will rot. I will die and disintegrate. All of this box that this computer is on <laughs> will deteriorate. Everything will pass and corrupt. It won't be so in heaven. But all of creation has been subjected to futility because of what Adam and Eve did. All right, because of that original sin. So because man has fallen from uh, a state of divinization, Adam was approaching godliness, again, for a very short period of time, and he completely fell and screwed that up. Now all of creation has the result of what happens when creation is not being divinized by God, right? Jesus Christ says, I'm the way and the truth of the life. There's no way of the Father except through me. I think that's John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. Life is in Jesus Christ. Cut off from life is death and deterioration. This is why, for example, when people say original sin is just the soul and not the body, one, that makes no sense because they admit corruption and death happens from sin. I mean, that's right from Romans, right? Um, death has entered the world through sin, Romans 5. So there's a reason why we die and corrupt. It's actually connected to the moral sin, to the spiritual death. Um, St. Gregory Nyssa talks about this, says the soul and the body corrupt because of the original sin. So that's why the Orthodox teaching on original sin takes both as hand in glove. It's, there's not some later scholastic division that makes absolutely no sense that somehow a body corrupts from original sin, but really the soul is what inherits original sin, not the body that corrupts and for the next body corrupts and they're all connected too. Doesn't make sense, but again, that, that actually is an idea in scholastic medieval uh, Roman Catholicism. Not every Roman Catholic buys into it. The more you get to Roman Catholicism, you start finding out a lot of pet doctrines um, really aren't dogmatic. In fact, most doctrines aren't really dogmatic. There's only so much they have authoritatively clarified by a pope speaking ex cathedra. That's beside the point. But I want you to read Romans 8, 20 to 21, because it's going to help us contextualize later allegories about the Theotokos and why they're consistent with the Orthodox doctrine of the Theotokos. So we'll go to the next passage. And first we're going to look at 2 Samuel um, 6, 9. All right. And I don't know why on BibleGetway.com they're telling you about a chiropractor with a, a woman that should be in a different sort of advertisement. But what can I tell you? It's not my fault. I don't choose the advertisements. Um, so... David saw the Ark of the Covenant, and he said, David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the Ark of the Lord come to me? Okay, that's interesting. Now, we go to Luke chapter 1, verse 43, and we see a very similar statement by Elizabeth. By why... Is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? All right. So we Orthodox believe the significance of these passages is that Mary's the ark. 
right? Why would Luke coincidentally have this parallel? And I don't have the Greek in front of me right now, but it's probably even close to the Greek. But all that aside, Mary's the Ark of the Covenant. So anything true of the Ark of the Covenant is true of Mary, at least, again, if the allegory holds. So that is the point there. And some might say, well, I don't find that convincing enough. Um, I'm going to blow your mind in a second, but not just yet. Um, first, I want to show why is it important that Mary is the Ark. And this is a passage, a couple passages you probably wouldn't think that hard about. First, we're going to look at 2 Chronicles 13.10, probably one you've thought about a lot because it kind of uh, offends everyone, right? God strikes Uzzah. So we look at 2 Chronicles 13.10, which, of course, I spelt wrong, so who knows that is going to come out when I do this. Um, this book does not exist in the Bible yet. Thank you. Um, it says 2 Chronicles 13.10, but as for us, the Lord is our God, and um, so I don't have the right passage here. 13.10. Oh, well, let me choose the whole chapter. I must have screwed something up. Um, so... My apologies, audience. So we're looking for with Uzzah when he is struck dead. And for all I know, I'm looking at the uh, the parallel in the Septuagint, and so that's going to complicate things. So let's just find real quick where Uzzah's talked about, because I have no idea how they spell him um, in this. Maybe it's First Chronicles 13.10. I can't remember. Um, da 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 Come on, Uzo. Where do you get killed already? And all right, we'll look at 2 Samuel 6 because I just got to go with this and I'll fix my website later. I don't know what I was doing. I wrote it at night when the baby was sleeping. So it says, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzo put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzo and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark. And David became angry because the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And now we see the um, right afterwards. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Right? So this is now very interesting, that connection between how could the Lord, uh, ark of the Lord, or how could the mother of my Lord come to me? Because... You touch the ark, you die. You defile the ark, you die. That's the whole idea. Uzzah had sin, the dirt didn't, right? The dirt would have been subject to futility, right, to corruption, like we read about Romans 8.21. But it didn't commit any actual sin. It wasn't defiled. Being defiled requires a consent of the will, a moral act, and that's not the case. So whatever the ark is, it's not supposed to be defiled, and because it's not supposed to be defiled, even approaching the ark is supposed to be a little bit scary. Like we've seen 2 Samuel 6, 9, and also we've seen Luke 1, How can the mother Lord come to me? Okay. So we're going to go to Numbers 4, 5. Hopefully I didn't screw up the reference here. You never know with me. And, uh, and Numbers 4, 5 is a very, uh, how do I put it, passage you'd read past like a lot of Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Go, what's the point of this? But I actually find it very interesting. Here's why. Because it relates to what we just read. It says, when the camp prepares a journey, Aaron and his son shall come, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. So when the, the ark was transported, it was covered with the curtains. Why? So whoever touched it would not defile it. This is the level of how protected the ark was. Now, it would be reading too much into 2 Samuel 6, and say, well, the ark must have been covered at that time. I'm going to venture a guess and say it was. Why? Because we have no other example in the scriptures that the ark was ever touched, defiled, or any sort of way. It was supposed to be held with these large rods so that way no one would ever handle it. It can't fall over. And tradition states, and we read about this in 2 Maccabees, um, that Jeremiah, when Israel fall, fell, took the ark and hid it somewhere. So, the, again, so the heathen wouldn't touch it and defile it. So we have no example anywhere other than 2 Samuel 6 that may say that the ark was defiled. So I'm going to guess that number 4 5 was enforced. It was actually covered. It was never really touched. So it got perilously close to a situation where it would have been uh, touched and handled in an inappropriate manner. 
But due to, like I said, the tradition of Jeremiah and Numbers 4 5, my interpretation is the ark itself actually wasn't handled. Just like Mary herself actually wasn't defiled. Um, being a woman back then, no police forces could have been a scary thing, but she was never defiled. Now, if you look at Numbers 4 15, we see a little bit more on this um, note where it says, when, and when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Korah shall come to carry them, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. Right? So all these things are covered. So like we even see elsewhere, they shall put on it all its implements. Um, this is like the golden altar and different things um, in the sanctuary. Uh, with which they minister there, the fire pans, the forks, the shovels, the basins, all the utensils of the altar, and they shall spread on it a covering of badger skins and insert its poles, right? So all these things are covered so that handled, so they're not defiled, they're all covered. So we have every reason to believe they were carried, they're supposed to be carried, but they were moved, transported, never handled, because they're not, the ark was never defiled. That's what I'm driving home here. And so if Mary's the ark, biblically, should have to not be defiled. Now, I'm about to blow your mind, and I'm actually going to share a screen on my own website because I have all the passages next to each other with the relevant Greek. Um, so you can see that, man, scriptures aren't kidding. All right? And so I'm just going to click stop screen Share screen. Come on, share screen. You know you want to share. And uh, top five biblical passages. So Exodus 40, 29 in the LXX, it's read exactly the same in the Masoretic text if you read chapter 40, verse 35. And this is what it says. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of testimony because the cloud overshadowed, remember that word, overshadowed it, and the tabernacle was filled with the glory of the Lord. All right? So before the tabernacle became God's footstool, before God actually set foot, he overshadowed it first. Take note of the Greek word. Now, this is not the only time this occurs. It happens with the temple, obviously, because the Ark of the Covenant is in the temple. Second Chronicles 7, 2, 3, And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children is it when all of the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their face to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord. So we can see the same thing happened to the temple. Nothing becomes God's footstool apart from God overshadowing it, which purifies it. So God purifies the tabernacle. God purifies the temple. Why? Tabernacle didn't commit any sin and it's Actually, it's like just this kind of cruddy little tent made of some nice wood and curtains and badger skins and stuff. Why can't God just step foot on that? Why can't God, yes, the temple was made with rocks and quarries and cedars of Lebanon and, and the altars itself, there might have been some uncut stones and stuff like that, according to the law. But why can't God just step foot there, right? You know, it's, did it commit any act of sin? Romans 8, 21. The creation was subjected to corruption, to futility. If God literally stepped foot on it, it would have been he would have been sub, uh, subjected to its impurity, which we're going to find that's a terminology used by the fathers. Speaking of why Mary was purified before Christ became incarnate in the womb, so now let's look at Luke one thirty five, and the angel answered her and said, "The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you." Therefore, also that the Holy One who is born to is to be born will be called the Son of God. So I'm just gonna back out a little bit. Want you to take note of the Greek word. They're not identical spelling because they're slightly different Greek words. Um, but we could see, for example, my wife actually could read the Greek. This means she understands, it, but she could read it. We can see that e thing, the pi. Um, we see that. Omega or O thing and Kia, like the car. All right. So we see what's in that word. Now, if we look at overshadow elsewhere, again, this is taken from the Greek. 
We see the E thing, the pie. <laughs> Be better. My wife did this. Omega. She walks downstairs. I'll make her do it. The Kia part. This is the same word. Pricing now has got to pay attention. Why would the ark be overshadowed before God came and Mary be overshadowed before God came if the teaching of the scriptures wasn't that Mary's the ark? I mean, obviously, that's the teaching of the scriptures. There's no if, ands, or buts. People don't like that, but sorry, that's the teaching of the scriptures. And the um, fact that the Greek parallel is so clear we have no re we have no reason to reject this. This is why I said like the orthodox interpretations of these scriptures are actually by far the most compelling. It's the only one that really makes sense. They go to the nitty gritty into the words. For those parts of me, listen, just be where the apostles themselves and the gospels and the epistles, when they quote the Old Testament, they're quoting the Greek translation, the Septuagint. So that's why when you see Greek words that are the same, it's relevant. Now, this also means the Roman Catholic has to pay attention because Mary was purified, the Ark was purified, and they would have been purified for the same reason. They created a matter subject to, to futility. So if Mary was immaculately conceived, that could not be true. It wouldn't work. There'd be no part of her subjected to futility. Now, there's prelapsarianists, uh, Roman Catholics that think that Mary had prelapsarian flesh, like Father Caps is one of these, and there's postlapsarianists. Um, again, I can't think of any real scholars right now, but they do exist, like Father Kipps in the 50s, and no one really knows that much about this dude. He was one of these, um, and long story short, the idea was, and there's popes that talk about it. I forget which. Actually, there's a uh, there was a bishop of uh, in England that taught it. Like, don't think his name was Wiseman. I forget his last name, but not relevant right now. And the idea is that the flesh would corrupt, but not the soul. And it was only the soul is without original sin. All right. And so I guess maybe you could shoehorn that, yes, Christ could have been made impure because the body was impure, but her soul wasn't or something like that. There's, again, the whole idea that a body could be in a, could be corruptible and impure, apparently, and the soul not and... The body is this way because of original sin and uh, subjected to corruption, but the soul is not when St. Gregory and Issa and the whole thing that makes sense is death comes through sin, that the reason we spiritually and physically die and corrupt is because of sin, um, and why the reason we don't is because we're divinized by God. You know, there's no way otherwise makes sense that, but that's why... The orthodox teaching of Mary's purification is not arbitrary. It's in the scriptures. That's what I want to point out. So I'm going to go to the um, last um, set of scriptures. And they're not actually explicitly about Mary. You could use the same scriptures to prove the intercession of the saints. And so why not? We'll do that right now. Um, and uh, we have Revelation 6.10. Um which states, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood and those who dwell on the earth. So what we have here is a um, biblical prayer from saints to God. And so if there's anyone who says, the Bible doesn't say the saints pray to God, it's absolutely untrue. <laughs> we have a passage right here in the Bible that shows that they do. Then we have Mark 12, 25, which says, For when they rise from the dead, um, speaking of anyone who resurrects, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So people who die become like angels in heaven. Why is this relevant? We're going to look, we're going to find out by reading Revelation 8:3. And guys, if you have any questions, now's the time because I'll just end the show. Um, Revelation 8.3 says that another angel having golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So the saints present prayers to God and the angel presents prayers to God. So we see that in Revelation 6.10 that the uh, the saints pray to God. We see in Mark 12.25 
The saints are like the angels, and we see in Revelation 8, angels present prayer to God with the saints. So the point is, saints pray to God. That, that's that's the whole idea, and God hears it. So we already see the entire Protestant position collapsing, that, oh, prayer to saints is not the scriptures, because it's explicitly in the scriptures. It's right there. Um, so the only thing they can say is, yes, they pray to God, but they just don't know what's happening on earth. So they could ask God about stuff, but they got no idea what's happening on earth. I'm about to disprove that. Second Kings 526. Then he said to them, said to him, um, this is speaking of Elisha, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot um, to meet you? Uh, and that's speaking of Naaman who was baptized uh, in the Jordan River. So he knew what, I forget that dude's name was, thought my head did. He knew what he did because his heart went with him. That a saint, even before he was dead, he was in his corruptible body, um, right? He had a law of the flesh, the law of sin working against them, or concupiscence, um, as Paul talks about in Romans 7. So even with those problems, he had to give the clairvoyance. He can know what's going on when he's not there. So if a saint on earth could do that, can't a saint on heaven do that? It's clearly ability of a saint. Clearly, heaven is outside the space-time continuum. So they got all the time in the world to answer prayers because it doesn't abide by the time that exists here. Um, maybe that's why it says to God a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. That the, the concept of time doesn't apply to same in heaven. And you go, well, that's just you speculate. And actually, that's physics. <laughs> because didn't Einstein have the theory of relativity and uh, actually based upon velocity, um, time is different depending on how quickly you're moving. So the laws of physics actually bear this out. So outside the space-time continuum, who knows how time relates? So that with clairvoyance means, yes, Mary, here's your prayers. And yes, the saints pray for you. Um, so the main thing would be that why would Mary be the chief of the saints in this regard? And uh, I'll just, why not, grab my icon? Why not? And th the reason would be because she bore God. She's the burning bush. She had the full dose of the logos. The logos for attorney has her flesh and blood. All right? Plus, you know, everything you ate and digested, and now it's glorified. But you get the point. Right? Jesus, it says uh, in Luke chapter 2, was obedient to his parents. Okay? So Christ would have every reason to listen to the prayer of this saint. And that's why our tradition makes all the sense in the world with the scriptures. What actually doesn't make sense would be to read these scriptures and say, saints don't pray for us, and Mary must not pray for us. And they have no idea what's going on because scriptures would actually contradict that. So, um... That will be the end of our presentation on biblical teachings on the Theotokos, you know, and why the scriptures bear out orthodox doctrine. And uh, I just think it's interesting and compelling that we have no indication that the scriptures be taken any other way. And as I said, we interpret the scriptures as the saints do, um, according to our tradition. So... We believe in the material sufficiency of scripture, like St. Vincent de Lorenz. Um, but you cannot interpret the scriptures apart from tradition. And I think even with a, a little bit of effort, as you can see, the most obvious interpretation of the script on many of those scriptures is in fact the Orthodox interpretation. Um, it's not always clear because allegories aren't clear, but otherwise those passages in isolation aren't clear either. So that is my presentation today. And um I got a question here. He said, why will Craig be on Sam's channel to discuss the Immaculate Conception? Um, I didn't know this was even public knowledge, to be honest. Um, God willing, um, next Sunday night, I'll be on Sam's channel. Um, please watch. I'll be presenting Orthodox Soteriology. And God willing, shortly afterwards, I'll be presenting Orthodox Mariology. Um, this is very important, actually, because... Anyone following this channel realizes you cannot understand Orthodox Mariology without having a correct understanding of, of the fall, without having a correct understanding of salvation, having a correct understanding of the energy essence distinction, right? Like all these things are connected, you know, they're connected, dude, you know, like you used to say when you were 19 in college, 
So it's um, it's good that we're going to start with soteriology. Um, and God willing, I don't know, I'm not such a doofus that, <laughs> that I'm invited back. Um, I plan on being back by God's grace um, to present the Orthodox doctrine. And uh, so let me bring up Rex. Um, Rex says, as a Catholic, I generally refer to the Blessed Virgin Mary under that title and not the Theotokos. Is that acceptable in Orthodoxy? Rex, that's a, a good question. And I'm very happy you're viewing this show because um, so much like, I don't know, it's like Roman Catholics versus Orthodox. I mean, so the best people I know are Roman Catholics. The reason I'm Orthodox is because of several Roman Catholics, their prayers, their kindness, their patience. Um, so Rex, you're an awesome guy. And uh, no, it should not offend you because the fathers themselves, they don't even call her Holy Mary. You know, something just call her Mary. Um, it's sort of like just a tradition over time where uh, we start granting titles and they don't go away. And that's why the titles get longer and longer and longer. Um, so in, uh, in the Western tradition, I think it's Santa Maria. You know, I think that's what, you know, St. Mary is in Latin. And there's nothing illegitimate about that. Um, and I know in the Orthodox tradition, there's churches to Mary, and that's how they're named, you know. Um, so, in the, you know, it would really be, I think, Agia Maria, you know, if you had it in Greek. So it's not bad, but ex expect certain Orthodox to jump down your throat for, I guess, no good reason. Um, you can just call her Mary. I mean, that's what people called her. I'm sure that's what her son called her. Oop, I want to make it straight. I love this icon, by the way. Don't you guys – Love this icon. Um, it's an Orthodox icon in the 19th century. And believe it or not, it's actually made in the Western style, which is very typical of Russian icons um, in that time. Um, I actually am more of a fan of slightly Westernized icons. Um, some are a little too Westernized, like my uh, Christ icon right here. Um, but that's my own personal aesthetic. Uh, but no, Rex, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just be just expected something that Orthodox will find weird. Um, Emil has, uh, I guess, a suggestion. Um, Craig, please discuss differences in the doctrines of grace between Orthodox and Catholics um, or Roman Catholics. We Orthodox believe we're the Holy Apostolic Catholic Church. And uh, that being said, um, I already have a script um, for what I'm going to say. I will post it online. For this particular reason, which is I want people to be able to look at the citations. And when I when you give any presentation or, or debate, sometimes you're dealing with stuff that's like so long. And even then, like, I think I'm wordier than most. I actually will read very long block quotes. It's hard to get context without reading fathers cover to cover. Like, it's kind of cheating to watch this show or to read books. Um, so that being said, I will try to get into that. I'm not an expert on Roman Catholicism. I could teach you what the fathers speak about the MG essence distinction. It's in the fathers. I could teach you about theosis because that's in the fathers. Stuff in Roman Catholicism is not in the fathers. And no effects to Rex. I'm sorry. I, I'm grateful, Rex, that uh, you're patient with me. This is an or this is Orthodox Christian theology. I'm not trying to bash you. But their categories of thought are from a later point in time. They're not in the fathers. Um, just like, again, the term Theotokos is not in the Fathers. So there's certain terminologies not in the Fathers, but arguably, and I think this is what Emil's getting at, uh, the concept of like created grace, which is from Thomism, um, which uh, I have to look more into this, but supposedly it's been dogmatized to the Council of Trent. That's not in the Fathers. So how do you make sense of it? Um, and so that is... Uh, that is uh, an idea. Hopefully I get into it. I'll try to look a little more into it. I want to make this final point. It's on the Theotokos. Um, I won't say on who or what show I'm commenting on. You could connect your own dots. I just want to say this to all my viewers. Don't take my word for anything. At least in this show, you saw scriptures. Take the scriptures word for it. Always look up the references. People will just say, yeah, this guy said this, but he never did. This scholar said this, but he never did. And they'll keep repeating it. They'll repeat it over and over and over. So people, well, he would he would be able to look like a fool if he made it up. But that's actually what he's doing. And uh, all I can tell you is if someone doesn't, doesn't give you a reference, they're lying to you. And if that reference is just from some sort of quote mine, it's not actually from someone reading the book. You can't find this quickly. Um then 
I would be very suspicious. Um, another thing I want you to watch out for is when people give references and they're like they're say Migna or you know or the or PG or whatever, right? They're they're right from the Greek, and unless he's telling you, listen, I you could find it here, but I am giving you a translation I did myself, and you can refer to the Greek here. Unless they're doing that, it shows that they're stealing it from a secondary source, which means you have to trust that secondary source contextually got it right, which is often not the case. Um, I will be having an article soon where with Hilary Poitier, you're going to find that in book two of On the Trinity, chapter 29, he's not only quoted wrong, he's it's translated so badly it will blow your mind. He's translated to make it look like he's teaching the filioque. And if you actually, I actually went to a lot of, it teaches the exact opposite. He actually says you you can't, um, he refuses to ask, to ask the question of the matter. But I'll have an article on that soon. So yes, sometimes you got to get into um, the Latin and, and things like that. Um, but that being said, my point is that when you're reading some, this, reading some book or listening to some dude online, you got to look it up. Unless the guy is an actual translator, like uh, Father Price or or uh, Doctor Friend, he's uh, the translations didn't exist, so they're quoting from memory, actually, from ecumenical councils directly from the original languages. Truly great scholars who were doing that back in the day. Um, unless they're they're doing that, you know, if it's just some dude online, especially without a actual seminary degree. You've got to look up the resources. A lot of them are liars, all right? They don't have real college degrees, or they have college degrees in something that have nothing to do with history. They don't know how – they have never been professionally trained in how to read these sources. Pretty much they just want to validate what they want to believe. They're not actually critical historians even the least bit. So I wouldn't call myself a critical historian, but the least bit I am, right? I'm actually published. I actually have a degree in it, so like <laughs> I actually do that. Um, but be wary of people that aren't, they're liars. They're, they could be proven to be liars. And, uh, the ironic thing is if that person responds to this, you know, he knows the liar. Cause I gave no other personal details, um, that you could otherwise draw from this. So I hope that he does, cause it would validate that, um, he's a liar, but part of me does not So I'm actually not trying to start a fight. I'm just trying to warn people. Um, I will respond definitively in time, just not yet. Uh, but people are liars. They'll be judged for their lies and for every idle word. May God have mercy on their souls and may God have mercy on mine for I have fallen so many times. Um, Emil says, well, the Theotokos title, um, wasn't that dogmatized at Ephesus? Um, yes, and it actually in, in later councils, it says the same thing. But my point is, right, that centuries later, we've got a term. So the, uh, we talk of energy essence distinction, but the word distinction you'll never find. You'll find the word energy and essence the same same sentence with early church fathers. Excuse me, early church fathers, um, particularly Gregory and Nyssa, particularly Maximus. Um, you can't understand what they're talking about, actually. <laughs> you know, without uh, understanding the energy essence distinction. Um, but that's my point. There's things that are true, but the terminology comes later. Um, so anyway, Craig, just be sure. What is your stance about ecumenism? Do you believe that Catholics are also the body of Christ? <coughs> That's not like a <coughs> sarcastic cough. It's a cough where I wish I had a cup of water on me. Interesting you asked this, T.O. Uh, Father um, John and I, Father John Whiteford, will be doing a show on ecumenism in August. I think it's like the 21st or something. It will be added to this channel. Um, and... All I can say is this, I'm sort of ignorant. Father John's actually giving me stuff to read on it. Um, also be aware that Father John is a Rokor priest. So until 2007, Rokor was on the large part not in communion with the rest of global orthodoxy. They were with Serbia and Jerusalem, so they weren't completely cut off. Um, but uh, so that aside, they're going to have a stronger anti-ecumenist stance because they were in communion with all these people that were ecumenist. Um, and there's schismatics from Rokor that think that Rokor went ecumenist. Um, all I can say is this. There's only one church. It's an institution. It's a physical body. Um, ecumenism is a docetist heresy. And I'm speaking very broadly. I don't know all the ins and outs of this, by the way. But any doctrine, any person that tells you 
there is an actual physical body of Christ that's like all connected and it, it could be amorphously elsewhere is a docetist, right? It's docetism is that Christ's body is only seemingly there. And um, there was a heresy called Athrata docetism, um, which was a teaching um, that Christ's body only appeared to corrupt because Christ was only in the glorified body. It's a, it was a teaching by monophysites. And just think of it, the uh, Christ was incarnate the divine hypostasis, they said, well, if he's divinized by the divine hypostasis, that must mean his human flesh was glorified in human flesh because it's completely deified. And that's not the orthodox teaching. There is a qualitative difference, even though both bodies are completely deified, between a glorified body, which is um, angelic, and the even a prelapsarian, um, not glorified body. It's important we make this distinction. There's actually, in Father Hasidicus's book, um, there's a passage where he does it. And uh, I would have to have him on and talk to him about that. I'm just guessing it's poor word, word choice. Um, but the point is this idea where Christ's body is somehow not really his body or is totally not, it only appears to be so is heretical. So no, the Orthodox church is the church. No other church is the church. No, the church is his body, which, you know, Normatively means salvation cannot be within those bodies. Salvation's in the Orthodox Church. It's only in the Catholic Church, which is us. Um, now, that doesn't mean there aren't great guys like uh, Rex. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't great guys like Rex that are saved. Um, because, for example, Trajan, who was in no church, who persecuted the Christian, is traditionally saved. Um, the church has canonized locally, for example, um, Jan Hus, Drama Pro, uh, Prague. Um, they have Akifest in Greece and in Czechoslovakia. You could say they're wrong, but the point is, in Orthodoxy, we have people like that canonized. Um, some would argue Saint Isaac, uh, the Syrians are saying, but some people also argue at that time there was a short-term communion with uh, what the groups that are historian. I really don't know enough about that era to actually pass intelligent comment on that. But people fail to differentiate between what's normative, what's an exception, right? So, for example, if I say I'm going to make something up, perverts go to hell, liars go to hell. doesn't mean every person that's ever told a lie is in hell or everyone that struggles with that thing is going to hell. We don't know. We don't know about the individual. We can only affirm what's true of the class of people. So salvation is Orthodox Church, not true of every individual. Salvation – is not in the Roman Catholic Church. It's not in any Protestant church. It's not. Uh, it's not among the uh, Miaphysites, as they call themselves, because um, they're schismatics, um, and this could be historically delineated and proven out. Um, but that's not true of each individual. And to be fair to the Miaphysites, um, they're technically in communion with the Church of Antioch, so they're actually tangentially in communion the Church, just like Rocor was. Um, perhaps Father John could correct me on the ecumenism show and show me where there's this difference here. Um, and believe me, there's plenty of conservative Orthodox that are against it. Like the uh, the fathers of Manathos wrote a letter very scathing, um, particularly on that topic. So um, I hope that answers that question. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. If this show has blessed you, please bless someone else. You can visit orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. <laughs> <laughs> you can bless the church in Cambodia, Father Roman, Father Pisces. Um, also, your local monastery needs support. The point is, always use a blessing to bless someone else somehow. Um, at the very least, please pray for me. Uh, God willing, uh, pray for me. I may have wisdom on Sam's show, and that may uh, come together, and that my uh, family may be healthy and blessed, because I've had shows that had to cancel due to family stuff. Um, so... Um, pray for me with that. I don't anticipate anything, but every day we should be expecting the Lord could come at any time. And so we don't know what moment will be last or what will happen next. So God willing, um, these things will be the case. So guys, if you have uh, any um, additional comments, um, leave them in the comment box. God bless you all. Have a great day.